we can at least try our part. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5 through verse number 8. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through verse number 8. I'm going to speak on, we've been, uh, Wednesday night prayer been going on now, I guess since I've been voted in as pastor since um, uh, back early June. Um, we've been teaching on prayer, and I hope it's really helped you in your prayer life. And um, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 5, the Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet. And when thou shut the, hast shut the door, thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Notice verse 8, though. It says, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. How encouraging is that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity for a few minutes to speak on the reality of prayer. I pray you'd help us uh, be uh, the prayer warriors, the prayer people of prayer that you want us to be. And, uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I read some things this week, and it really ch touched my heart about prayer. Prayer is a priority. It ought to be a priority. Uh, I know we're all busy people. Everybody in here is busy. And, uh, but sometimes we get too busy. I like what R.A. Torrey said about prayer and priority. He said, we are too busy to pray, and so we are too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but accomplish little. We, may, we have many services, but few conversations. We have much machinery, but few results. That's what R.A. Torrey said. And my, how convicting that is. Uh, George Mueller, a man of great faith who saw God provide for thousands of orphans, he took this. Mueller was a busy man. Now, notice this. But he made prayer a priority. He said in his own words, and listen, for more than half a century I've never known one day when I had not more business than I could get through. For 40 years, I have annually about 30,000 letters. Okay, now this is before typing machines and um, uh, the, the emails. Uh, now, how would you like to send out 30,000 emails in a year? Okay, well, this, this is handwritten letters, all right? And most of these have passed through my own hands. I have nine assistants always working corresponding in German, French, English, Danish, Italian, Russian, and other languages. Then, as pastor of a church of 1,200 believers, great has been my care. I have charge of five orphanages, also at my publishing dis depot, the printing and circulation of millions of tracts, books, and Bibles. But I've always made it a rule never to begin work until I have a good season with God. Now, there's none of us in here more busy than George Mueller. I mean, five orphanages, a church of 1,200 people, all these letters that he's mailed out, all these people that he's had, to, I'm sure, to oversee. I like what John Bunyan said. John Bunyan, the author of The Pilgrim's Progress, he said, He who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. What a good thought. You know, if you don't start your day out with God, more than likely you're not going to end with God. You're not going to find him in between. Uh, that's why those that really have a fervent prayer life choose to they choose to, to be with God in the morning. James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Back to our Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8, we read here that uh, the Pharisees, they pray one way, but then God, of course, Jesus instructs on how to really pray. And then verse 8, the encouraging verse, but, know ye, but not, be ye not therefore like unto them, talk about those Pharisees, them hypocrites, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. You know, prayer is a Bible subject, but it's a big subject. I'm talking about capital B, capital I, capital G. Prayer is a big subject, way more than we can spend on in three or four months. Uh, prayer is something that is a continual work the rest of your Christian life. 
And so it's a big subject. It's a big subject in any way you look at it. Prayer is a benevolent subject. It is done on behalf of others. Our praying is not selfish. It is for others as well as for ourselves. So every time we get down to pray, it should not just be about you. You ought to be praying on the behalf of others. I mean, matter of fact, a lot of my prayer is not about me. It, it, man, uh, I told a guy this week who called and said, Man, how's the church doing? I said, Well, my perspective, the church is doing great. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I know that behind the scenes, I'm, I'm sure there's a few folks that, you know, they, they, they're, they're wondering about things, and I don't know. I'd rather not see that or hear that, but... That's, you know, it's probably the God's truth, I'm sure. But on the outside looking in, uh, the church, man, we couldn't find parking spots on Sunday and people was looking for seats. And we had, I mailed out eight thank you cards this week of visiting family Sunday, eight visiting family Sunday. Uh, we had 11 folks baptized. We had two folks saved Sunday. We had a family of five or six join the church. Uh, that's a pretty good day. I don't care if you go to a church of 5,000. That's a pretty good day. And, uh, man, he was like, whoa, praise God. And I said, but I'll tell you one thing pastoring has done. It has increased my prayer life. Because now I've got a church directory, and I've used it now as my prayer list, and it has all the kids' names on it. It's got the, got the and when I go through there, I can pray. And then uh, I got, I got their, the, the, the names of people and the faces of people, and I've got their kids, and then I remember their prayer requests. I write those out, and I, I know what people's praying for and how they're praying. And, preacher, would you pray for this? I'd rather not voice it. I'd, I, I just want you to pray specifically. And I have wrote those things down. I had a lady walk out, uh, walk out uh, this past week and handed me a picture of her son. And this week I've been praying for her son with her his picture right there. He's a military guy. You know, I, I've been thinking, God, it's increased my prayer life. Thank you, Lord. It's increased my prayer life. It's helped me as a pastor. And you know what? You really want to care about somebody? Start praying for them. You want to start truly caring. Some of you in here, you know, you love your husband. You love your wife. Do you pray for them? It's one thing for you to say, Boy, I really love you, and it's one thing to maybe do some things for them, but it's another thing to go to God for them. I mean, how about the children? Now, I love my children, but I'm doing them a great injustice if I'm not praying for them. Prayer is the biggest thing we can do. Prayer is a beneficial subject, not only benevolent, not only big, not only Bible, but it's a beneficial, it's profitable, it is productive. Nothing is more rewarding than prayer. So if you think about it, why ain't we doing it? If it's rewarding, if it's beneficial, if it's going to grow the, your, your life, it's going to help your family, if it's going to help the church, why aren't we not doing it? It benefits the one who prays. When we pray, we obey the Word of God. It benefits the one we pray for. For prayer to be real and effective, there must be. Number one, I want you to write these down if you can. On Wednesday nights especially, Try to bring a pad and a pen. If you want to write them in your Bible, you can. But these are really helpful in my prayer life, and I've wrote some things down. I'm not, I really strive to be a man of prayer, but I know we, that, you know, I, I've got much work to be done there. Number one, look at verses 5 and 6 again. The Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, staying in synagogues in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You know what their reward is? People seeing them. Let me ask you this. Now I know this is a little rough around the edges, but do you do things just because people see you? I mean, oh, I, I like to pray in front of people. Well, that's okay, but are you praying in the closet? Why ain't the preacher call on me to pray? Well, Let's see, we might have three or four prayers a service, and we've got, you know, sometimes we've got 30, 40 men in here. We'll get around to you, you know. But you ought to be praying in private way more than you're praying in public. So prayer is, it says here, their reward is, their reward for the, for the, for the, the hypocrites or the Pharisees is, Dear God in heaven, our hallowed Father, you know, they're so, you know, have you ever heard somebody pray and it was like one of these, they read it off of a scroll, you know? 
you ever been to a ball game or went somewhere and and uh, you uh, uh, went somewhere and it was you know like for instance somebody, I, I was watching I, I'm a big NASCAR fan. I just like to see fast cars, loud cars. I like to see crashes and burnouts, spinouts, and uh, that's the redneck blood. Amen. Amen, brother Jerry. Amen. Brother Wayne. All right. And uh, we like NASCAR. I don't. I do have an antenna on my truck too. Amen, brother Jerry's like, what kind of antenna is that? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, it makes me feel like you know we're still in the sticks. Amen. And but I like to watch NASCAR. But I was watching NASCAR on. On uh, on Sunday, and I, they said now the, now for the invocation. Well, invo the word invocation to me is already like I just don't want to hear it, you know. Uh, now for the invocation, and uh, now there's nothing wrong with the word invocation, but just say, man, now for the prayer. Now we're gonna pray, folks. We're gonna pray. Invocation. All right. Here's the invocation. So this guy gets this piece of paper out, and 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 he starts reading this prayer. And honestly, I, I heard the prayer and I was thinking, my goodness, Lord, if you're within a thousand miles of that prayer, then I'm Porky Pig. I'm serious. That, that I mean, he was re it never mentioned Jesus, never mentioned Jesus in Jesus, never would in Jesus name. You know, first of all, folks, how in the world do we get to God but through Jesus Christ? So it, what are you, you know, are you just saying words? And I, again, I was just, and I know it's a NASCAR race, and this guy was, I don't know where he was from, but I just thought, is this really where we're at? Uh, the, the, the prayers is just reading them off of a paper. And you know what prayer ought to be? It ought to be from the heart. Hey, when we pray, it should be from the heart. But because the Bible says here they stand in synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say to you, they have their reward. You know what that guy's reward was Sunday? Praying at the NASCAR race. Now, I would love to pray at a NASCAR race. I'll be honest. I would, I would go if it wasn't on Sunday. If they said you can pray at Darlington on Saturday night, I'd be there. What an opportunity, man. You get to go to pits. See them cars? And I would pray the gospel. I'd say, now, Lord, if these bunch of sinners, amen, <laughs> need Jesus. I mean, it'd be a long prayer, but they'd probably be over there trying to put duct tape on my mouth and all, pushing me off the stage. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I would have a good time at the NASCAR race. I wouldn't do it on Sunday, but I'd do it on Saturday for sure. And, uh, but, you know, it ought to be from the heart. Now, I've got off on, on that a little bit. But their reward is open. I mean, Millions of people saw this guy pray, and wow! Oh, he got his name mentioned and got it on the, you know, got it on the on the subtitles there at the, on the TV screen. But that's his reward. And here in in verse number six, the Bible said, "But when thou prayest, enter in thy closet. When thou when thou hast shut thy door, pray thy Father which is in secret." So it goes from one extreme to the other. He said, you know what your reward's going to be is when you shut that door and nobody sees you but God. Folks, we, now there's nothing wrong with you playing, praying in public. I think you ought to. When you go out here to eat, you ought to pray in public. I remember one time on a youth trip. We were at teens somewhere, and we, we were traveling somewhere. I can't remember where it was. We had a bus full of teens, and I remember telling these teens, they were like, okay, you know, we usually stop to eat. I got up on the bus, and I said, all right, Let's pray and you know before we go eat, and we did it all the time that way. I'd pray, and then the kids got off the bus, they go order and eat. But this time I said, folks, I'm not praying for your food. I said, let's go in this restaurant and let's show these people that every one of us teenagers can pray for your own food, and be it. Let's be a blessing. Yeah, how many people have been in a restaurant and see teenagers bow their head and pray? What a blessing that is. See, there's nothing wrong with praying in public. But I believe we get our biggest blessing when we close that door behind us and it's just you and God and you meet Him and nobody's patting you on the back. Nobody's saying, oh, look at these little kids or look at these teenagers or look at that family over there praying. No, I believe our blessing is when we get behind that closet door and say, God, I need you right now. Nobody else is in here, but, but it's just me and you. And that's when we get our blessings. Number one, I want you to write down a disciplined preparation in prayer. A disciplined preparation in prayer. You know, we prepare for everything else in life, and in so many things we spend a lot of time doing it. Our preparation for prayer should be twofold. Number one, it should be a personal examination. Verse number five, 
It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, saying in the synagogues and in the, street, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. It's a personal examination. But number two, it's a practical examination or elimination. Practical elimination. Verse number six. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and when thou shut the, hast shut the door, pray thy, to thy Father which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So it's personal examination, but it's also practical elimination. Get rid of all the distractions when, thou, when you're approaching God. Uh, one thing that I like to do, because it always happens, is when I'm praying, the cell phone is shut off or in another room. Because I can tell you, get in there and praying for any amount of time, you're going to hear a buzz, a beep, phone call, and you, you know, your flesh automatically says something's wrong, answer the phone. And usually, nine times out of ten, it's not an emergency, and you've done been interrupted with your prayer life. I leave that stuff because most of the time there's no emergency. It's just a, a, just a disruption. You need to eliminate those things and say, you know what, it's my time and God's time. Last night, uh, my wife uh, planned a very good, we hadn't had a date since we've been in South Carolina, not a, not. We ain't, it was way before South Carolina, last time we had a date. It was, it was still North Carolina pre, I mean, we, way North, I mean, we ain't had a date. We tried to think last night, Brother Gary, when's the last time we had a date? Without kids now. And we could not think. That's sad, ain't it? You know, you tell these married couples, oh, y'all to date, y'all to date, y'all to date. And then you're like, man, when's the last time I went on a date? And, uh, and so my wife planned this nice date. She said, we ain't went out. Brother Caleb and Miss Leah watched the kids, and um, we went out. And she had all this stuff we were going to do and all. But you know what? We, we determined, let's spend time with each other. If somebody calls, let's not answer it. Hey, my dad called while we were on the date. I hadn't talked to my dad in a few days. He'd been preaching. I thought, you know, something inside of me said, you better answer it. It could be an emergency. And then I remember Mom saying he's out of town. He probably didn't know. You know what? It wasn't an emergency. We were just on a date and enjoyed each other's company. You know what? God wants to do that. God wants it to be just the way that we would treat our own spouse, our, our girlfriend, our fiancé, someone we enjoy and spend time with. But you know how we treat God? God, I'll talk to you as long as my best friend don't call, as long as my favorite TV show ain't on. God gets on the back burner. We must eliminate. There must be a discipline preparation. We have to prep. We, if you were to invite our family over to eat, um, or if we were to invite you, I know my wife is. I can't cook. I can't microwave. I mean, I'm horrible. Uh, I can't. I'm sorry. I can grill a few things on a grill, but when that's transferred into the kitchen, it's it's called disaster. Get the smoke alarms ready, and uh, and the uh, and one of these uh, fire extinguishers. It's going to be bad. And you don't want to put that in your mouth if I'm cooking it, amen. But my wife's a very good cook, and I, I mean, I, I think so. She's very good. And I thank God for Pinterest because a lot of the tough stuff she gets off comes off of that Pinterest. And, oh, I see something. I'm like, yeah, good, praise God. And, uh, you know, so I'm looking at those meals. She does. But if you were to come over and see, if we knew you were coming, my wife would prepare way more than 15 minutes in advance. It'd be like that morning she wakes up, we got to clean the house. We got to get this. I got to go. The day before, she's going to the grocery store to get, oh, I forgot something. I got to go back out. I mean, it's, it's preparation just for what? A couple hours? I mean, you know you ladies are like that. But here it is. There's the same thing. as It's discipline preparation before we meet God. There ought to be some things. There ought to be some things examined, some things eliminated. Number two, not only a discipline preparation in prayer, according to verses 5 and 6, but also a devotion a devotional realization in prayer. A devotional realization in prayer. Verses 6 and 7. I'll read verse 7. Uh, it says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So there ought to be a devotional realization in prayer. We are visiting no ordinary friend. We are meeting with the friend of sinners. We are about to approach 
number one, a God who sees everything. Think about it. This is a God who sees everything. And little old me gets to go into the presence of God who sees and knows everything. Man, that is amazing that he would even want to spend time with me. That's amazing. So when we do that, we're about to approach uh, this God who sees everything. Number two, a God who knows everything. A God who knows everything. He sees and then he knows. What's that verse say in verse 8? It says, uh, he says that your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So that's an all-knowing God. It's an, he's an all-knowing God. And then number three, the God who hears everything. That's convicting, ain't it? Now, here's the good things we do. He hears our prayers. He knows our thoughts. He sees our actions. He hears everything. So he hears your prayers. But he also hears that lack of faith sometimes. He hears, I talked to somebody today, and they they uh, were having some problems with somebody else in their family. And uh, and they told me, they said, we, we're, we're screaming at each other all the time. Screaming and fighting and fussing and and saying ugly words. They they she told you know, told me some things they had said and I thought, My goodness, that's awful. I mean it really is. It's awful. But I thought, you know, what's even worse than your pastor hearing it or your best friend or somebody at God hears it. God hears it. Can you imagine God who loves us, who sent his only begotten son Jesus to die for us and his son died for those sins? And we know He hears the good things. He hears our Bible study tonight. He hears our prayers tonight that was prayed. Boy, does He not hear some of those ugly things we say. And it breaks the heart of God. And, and I reminded that person about those words that they were saying to one another. By the way, when they get down on their knees to pray, unless they've gotten right with each other, God does not hear those prayers. How in the world are we supposed to be at each other's throat and say, yeah, I'm going to, ah, you, ah, ah, and then you just get in your closet and you pray. That ain't going to happen, friend. No, you need to get right with them. And then number four, the God who can do any anything. Number four, the God who can do everything. The God who can do it. So we're, we're not just talking to a person who can see, know, and hear, but we, we're talking to somebody who can do. He can do anything. I think that, song i always hear the the little children sing that god can do anything god can do anything god can do anything but fail isn't that something god can do anything and god can do anything but fail and that's exactly what god uh he can do anything but fail so isn't it wonderful when you go into that prayer closet and you shut the door or you go into your car and it's just you and God and maybe you're driving to work or you get beside your bed and it's just you and God or wherever you're at to pray. Isn't it wonderful to know that what you're praying about, God can do it. God can do it. Wouldn't it be sad if you were, let's say, a Muslim tonight or a Catholic? Uh, today I was out here, uh, Brother Wayne and Brother Joel had left. It was just me and just me and Jake. And I was about to lock, or no, the doors were locked. I was about to open them up. I was going to leave. My wife was going to come. I was going to run home, change real quick, and come back. And uh, so I was, uh, I heard somebody knock on the door. Or no, they pulled on the door, the front door out here. Just I heard somebody jerking on the door, and I was back here. So I ran up to the door, and I, I was like, man, somebody's trying to get in. And it was two teenage boys and uh, on bikes, and they were hot. You could see, man, sweat. And... Uh, I opened the door and I said, guys, can I help you? And they said, no, well, no. They acted like they didn't pull on the door. And I'm like, okay. You know, and I said, well, I said, uh, y'all want to come in for a minute and get cooled down for a second? They got two chairs right here. And they came in, sat down, and uh, and then the Lord said, witness to them. You know? And so I pulled out gospel tracts and I handed it both to them. And one of them was a Catholic and, uh, and lives right behind us here and and so anyway, I asked, and then another one went to a Baptist church in the area, a pretty good-sized Baptist church. And I, and I, I asked him, I said, hey, boys, I said, uh, let me ask you a question. I said, if you die today, you sure you go to heaven? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to heaven. I said, okay, well, that's good. Praise the Lord. And I said, how? How are you getting to heaven? And one of them said, well, he said, uh, I believe in them angels, and I believe in God, and I believe that, you know. And I said, well, that's good. And he just kept using the word I believe. And I said, well, guess who else believes? And they said, who? And I said, the devil. So the devil believes in God, that he is an angel. 
He's been in heaven. In fact, he goes back and forth quite a bit. Really? I said, yeah. I said, so that's what you're going to tell God you deserve to get to heaven is you believe in him? Well, yeah, I think so. I've, I've obeyed what, you know, what the rules. I said, no, hold on a second. I said, y'all believe God's word? Oh, yeah, we believe God's word. I showed him God's word. I said, but that's not what the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. I said, this is a gift. Heaven was paid for by the Son of God. We don't deserve it. Man, that, boy's, that Catholic boy's eyes opened up. At the end of that, he prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save him. Both of them did. They, they may come Sunday and that other boy uh, goes to a church and had no idea what salvation really was. He just thought it was something you do. He didn't realize it was something that was already done. Amen? It was done. And uh, so, you know, uh, God can do anything. God can save anybody. God can answer any prayer. I've got a prayer right now that I'm praying. I know it seems ridiculous. I told my wife this prayer that I'm praying, and God confirmed it this week that He's going to answer it. But I just don't know when, but He's going to answer it. And I, I'm, He's confirmed it, that God's going to answer this prayer. It's a personal thing. It's a need that that w our family needs, but God, is He's confirmed it through the... If I told you the craziest way He confirmed it, you wouldn't believe You would laugh me out of the building tonight. But He confirmed it in a very little way, or a very big way, but little to you. And uh, But still, uh, He did. And, and if I told you, 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 would, you would think it's crazy. And uh, But it's, it's good, because God's going to answer that prayer because He said He wants us to pray, because He can do anything. Then number three, and I'm done. It's 8.30. We see that discipline preparation in prayer, devotional realization in prayer, that we're, we're, we, we, we're talking to God. And then number three, a determined expectation in prayer. A determined expectation in prayer. Verse number eight, my favorite verse out of these verses. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things, what things, big things, little things, ye have need of before ye ask him. God answers prayer. And his promises are yea and amen in Christ. We read, Ask and it shall be given. Whatsoever ye ask in my name. Matthew 21, 22, Hebrews 11, 6, James 1, 6 through 7. And by the way, these, these are always quoted when we're talking about prayer. I just read that James 5, 16, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All these are prayer verses, Matthew 21 uh, and uh, 22, and all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. What a great verse. But then we gotta, we got we to gotta understand that it's a determination in expecting in prayer. We've got to expect that God's going to answer that prayer. Faith. Faith. Uh, uh, number one, in trustfulness. Verse 8 says, uh, in verse James 1, 8, rather, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And God, it, it, we got to trust God. God wants us to demonstrate our trust in Him and not be wishy-washy in this thing of expecting prayer. How about thankfulness? Thankfulness. We ought to be thankful uh, when we pray. Trusting is really thanking God even before the answer comes. How about, have you ever tried that before? This kind of convicted me, but I've, uh, when when I, uh, this prayer that I'm praying, when I got confirmation that God was going to answer the prayer, now I've started thanking God and saying, God, thank you for it. Thank you for that confirmation. Thank you, God. When you do it, th wouldn't it be, maybe it'll speed the process up. I don't know. But, you know, I'm trying. Amen. But I want to be thankful. I want to be thankful in my prayer. Trusting is really thanking God even before the answer comes. And lastly, truthfulness truthfulness trustfulness thankfulness and truthfulness and you know what that truthfulness comes from the heart a life dedicated to the will and plan of god self and sin are blotted out truthfulness being truthful with god you know i tell people you might as well be truthful for god because he already knows i don't know why you're trying to be dishonest with god he already knows 
He already knows. It ain't like you're going to hide it from him. It's not like you're going to try to cover it up like Achan did or whoever else. You know, David, all of them tried to cover things with God, Moses. It ain't going to work. Be honest. Be honest with God, truthful in our prayers because God knows all things. I hope tonight encouraged you in prayer um, in, in these next few weeks. You know, we're just getting started as a church, uh, but this church is about to take off, and the fuel that's going to give this church the energy to reach Simpsonville and the surrounding area is going to be prayer. Because if we go out here and grab a handful of tracks and say, hey, I'm going to be a witness, you might be a witness a week or two, but if you're not praying, it's going to run out. But if you're praying, that energy. Uh, Brother Raymond gave me a sermon. I'm going to preach it one day. He gave me a sermon today. Brother, I like getting sermons from, from people. We had a problem back here in the ladies' restroom with no lights. We, when they were laying the uh, insulation, it, it sparked something. It, it became, uh, it, it got disconnected. Some wires back in there got disconnected. So Brother Wayne called me this morning and said, we don't have any lights in the ladies' room. And I said, well, God forbid, Dad. we got to do something about that, amen? And we, these ladies need something, you know. So uh, we went down here, and I didn't know what to do. I'm not an electrician. So I called Brother Land. Brother Land came by. Brother Will stopped by. And we thought we had it fixed. Well, then it, it, it went out again. And so Brother Land was up there messing around. He lifted that insulation up and those those uh, little little sheets there and those little things. And he got up in there and got in the ladder, and he looked, and he said, well, he said, it looks like to me you got some wires here, but they're not connected to the main source of power. They're not connected. They're just, they're just there. And there's no, there's no power because it's not connected. And I thought, well, there's prayer. If we're going to have power, folks, we're going to have to get connected to the main source. The reason there wasn't no power back there is because them wires were just, they were taped together, Brother Raymond, but they wasn't taped to the right thing. It wasn't connected. And when he connected it to the right source, get what? Well, let there be light. And when we flipped it on, there was light because we got connected to the right source. Church, if this church is going to be the power of God, it's going to be resting the conviction, uh, the power of God. People's going to have the power of God on them, on, on the messages, in the singing, in everything that we do. The main source of the power is going to be prayer. See it. And then the byproduct of that is going to be witnessing. And, and all of our, you know, things that we do, our ministries. But if we're not connected to that source, it's all going to be in vain. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for, uh, Lord, uh, our time together. And, uh, Lord, as we bow our heads in prayer, Lord, I pray that this is not the first time that we've talked to you today. And, Lord, if it is, Lord, we need to apologize. And, uh, God, I know we're all busy. Everybody's busy, and, and if we had everybody come up on this platform tonight and say how busy we were we we'd be tired from listening but god uh, we're, we are we too busy to speak to the one who created this world er, this earth and sent his only begotten son jesus to pay the price for us are we too busy for that i hope not i hope that we're not we've become disconnected from the main source god if we have may we get plugged in tonight i pray